promoting other people's business actually makes you look really good. And people are like, wow, why are you promoting all these other people's business? But that attracts people to yours. Welcome to the More Than Corporate Podcast. I'm Amber Furman, recovering perfectionist and serial accomplisher. If you're anything like I used to be, you've been living your life thinking that if you accomplish enough stuff, you'll finally find the success you've always wanted. But what if it's not about accomplishing more stuff? What if it's about accomplishing the right stuff? I believe you don't find success. You create it by intentionally designing the life you want and having the courage to get out of your comfort zone to live your design. I went from doing what I was supposed to do to doing what I love to do, and now I get to help others do the same. Keep listening as I chat with inspiring people who make it their mission to live their best life every day and learn how you too can live the life you've always wanted. Welcome back to another episode of the More Than Corporate Podcast. Today, I have the amazing Sean Dill and Lacey Book. They're chiropractors by profession, and now they serve as certified book yourself solid coaches in the entrepreneurial space. This power couple runs the Black Diamond Club, which is a group of 600 plus service professionals with a desire to reach more people, make a bigger impact, and create the lifestyle that they deserve. Their work is driven by relationships, collaboration, and their mission where health and success are known as fundamental truths rather than fundamental pursuits. I love that statement. I love everything that they stand for. You guys have heard me talk about this before as an attorney by trade, that life is not what I signed up for and figuring out how to really create that for myself, how to run a business, how to just have that life I wanted instead of the life that ended up being forced on me by the constrictions of the profession. So I'm so excited to dig into all of those amazing topics here with Sean and Lacey. Before we do that, I want to remind you that this episode is brought to you by the by Success Development Solutions and the Design Your Life Book Club. As you know, I believe that your level of success rarely exceeds your level of personal development, right? Jim Rohn made that clear. We get to really dig in and learn from the people who have shown us their mistakes, their wins in the books that they've written. We get to learn from those. We get to implement those things. The Design Your Life Book Club allows you to do that with a group of like-minded entrepreneurs. And then I actually introduce you to every single author from the books that we read. You get an opportunity to learn from them on a deeper level. If that sounds like something that you're interested in, head over to Success Development Solutions, click that contact button, and let's find out if that's a good fit for you. Without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into this episode and hear from Sean and Lacey. Hi, Hi Amber. Guys. How are so you happy doing? To be here. We're doing great. Oh my gosh, Thank I'm so you. happy to have you. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day on a holiday weekend. Um, well, I guess it's not the weekend yet, but it feels like it. I don't know if it feels it like Friday feel for like you, it. but it feels like Friday to me. It's crazy. So I'm really interested to know, um, as a professional service provider that has found this amazing world of podcasting to get away from the life I created for myself in my professional service. How did this happen for you guys? Chiropractors by trade, and then you build this amazing business to help others. Like, what was that like? Because, and, and the reason I ask before I let you guys answer is like, I feel like so many people look at the lives that we create and be like, why would you ever want out of this? And so I love mm -hmm. digging into this, this issue that we all seem to create for ourselves by following our dreams. Well, in our case, and this is not the case for everybody, but we super are passionate about chiropractic still. Mm -hmm. So we were, um, both of us were in practice. I practiced for many years in the country of Costa Rica. Um, I was fortunate enough to write the law that to this day still regulates the practice there. So when I went there, there was no, no regulation. Um, opened up a practice in the United States when I came back. Lacey then... Um, began working in that. We developed um, scale to that. We created a licensing model, then created a franchising model. And all along the way in the service world, if you believe that your service can actually change the world, you have these moments when you kind of feel small, when you realize like, man, I'm just, mm -hmm. I'm helping the people. Like my practice was huge in Costa Rica. And I was like, but internationally, I'm not even making a dent. And then mm -hmm. when we started scaling, we we opened up a franchise. So we own a chiropractic franchise. But even then, you're like, we're not really making a dent. 
Um, what I felt in sort of expanding past chiropractic was it was an opportunity to create influence, to create relational capital, to still be able to lead a conversation that had to do with, in fact, you said that you like the statement that health and success are known as fundamental truths. Well, I mean, a lot of things in life work the same way as we believe the human body does is that fundamentally we're healthy, fundamentally we're successful, and then we create interferences to that expression of health or success. So getting outside of chiropractic, entering into the entrepreneurial space was really just an opportunity to create a bigger platform to talk about these the thing things that we love. Yeah. I mean, yeah. We would never have been talking to you if we were chiropractors talking about chiropractic and neck pain and back pain all day long. Yeah. Um, there's so much about that journey that I love. And the first thing is the fact that you guys are still very much passionate about what you do. I think that there's so many people in this space that are um, spreading that message that if you're unhappy, you have to leave your profession and you have to start something mm -hmm. new. And, and to, I personally love being an attorney. I also needed to find a way to create the life I wanted within the legal field. And mm -hmm. I think that you guys can totally resonate with that. It's so easy for the hours that we're expected to work and the, the responsibility that we have to our clients to take over our life if we let it. And so finding those boundaries and enforcing those, I feel like is just as important of a message as if you're unhappy, let's go, you know, on a, on a midlife crisis trek across the country and figure out what we're going to do with our life. Right. So I think that that's really interesting. What was the franchising situation like for you guys? How did you get into that? And how did you navigate that in a regulated field? Oh my gosh, that was quite the journey. I mean, honestly, so when Sean came back from Costa Rica, um, in Costa Rica, the model that he practiced there was um, you know, charging for what it was worth. And it was an all cash environment. And it was like just seeing people and practicing pure chiropractic. So when he came to the back to the States, um, he was like, I'm just going to repeat the same model here. Well, in most healthcare professions, you know that that's not the norm. And so creating a successful office, people began to look at that and say, you know, I want to do that too. How are you practicing that model? And that's what started the licensing journey. Um, but I'll tell you what was really interesting because we've worked together the entire time, chiropractors in the office together, now business consultants for service providers together. And I remember very early on when we were working um, in the office, I didn't want to like let him go. I wanted to be in the office with him. And he was creating this model and so many people wanted to know about it. Eventually, I had to get out of his way and allow him to go down that path of being the visionary to develop that. And so it went from one office in Dublin, California, to now where we have uh, 14 offices nationwide, wow. um, all the way from uh, Hawaii, all the way to uh, Tennessee. Okay, and I'm sorry, those... Wait, wait, let me, oh, sorry let me... go ahead. Because I know the lawyer in you was not asking that. Right, because in a highly regulated field, I heard you say. Yes, yeah, so, no, ah. and and the the coach in me loves that, and the person in me loves that. Yeah. I'm just curious from a regulation field of how you oh. make sure we paid hard. lots of money yeah. and hired the right people to help us navigate it. Lawyers yes. like yourself, that's what we did because <laughs> you don't know how to be in a highly regulated field, and you know you want to do things properly from the ground up. We knew that we had to hire and we had to pay top dollar for people that were very familiar with the profession and that those specific regulations. So we definitely, it cost way more than we anticipated, but it was done right from the very beginning. And there's a lesson in that for everybody, right? Which is so important. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I have to say that you guys are... Um, I, I, I assume in a relationship, if I'm wrong, am I wrong? No, no, no. Oh, yeah, we're okay. <laughs> the last name, I was like, before I say this, I don't know the answer to this question. And it's like, I, okay. So I was, I have met more, and I don't know what it is about the profession, but I have met more husband and wife chiropractor teams than any other professional field yeah. that I've ever been in. And yeah. it's so amazing to me that I keep meeting people that are very similar to what you just said, Lacey. Like, I just want to have this small office, husband and wife office. We want to grow, but then that takes us away from this office that we've built for each other. I'm interested to know if you have an opinion on what it is about that profession that encourages that kind of unity. Oh, go ahead. 
no, I, well, I think that the, the chiropractic like philosophy, the way of living is uh, a little bit outside of the box for most people. And so when you find an individual that I think connects with you on that, you have already a likeness, right? Just like entrepreneurs connect together. Other lawyers connect together. For some reason- No, it- we don't. <laughs> <laughs> I made an assumption there. No, oh, you're fine. Do that with you. <laughs> you're fine. Okay. Not lawyers, other service providers <laughs> connect together. Um, I think that there's a deep connection that chiropractors have over the way that they live their lives, their belief systems, and then the profession itself. So it creates a, a significant unity between them. And then they are passionate. Most chiropractors are extremely passionate about delivering the message. And so to have somebody by your side that I think feels that same way. It, it goes a long way. And that's why I think a lot of them end up staying together. They meet in school, they fall in love, and then they continue that relationship as they're delivering their message and living out their passion. I love that. Um, I think it's super interesting that you just talked about this unifying experience in school that goes into your career. Mm-hmm. And in law school, we actually had in our orientation a orientation specifically for spouses on how to not have your relationship killed by law school. And Mm -hmm. so it's so interesting to me that the analytical, legal, cutthroat side of law school, and then this um, holistic side of Mm -hmm. the chiropractic profession create completely different results from Mm -hmm. the very beginning of the education process. It's, it's something that I haven't actually seen until this episode of like the correlation between all of the husband and wife doctors that I know, which I think is really cool. Yeah, it's interesting that you say that because um, this is the uh, double-edged sword when it comes to chiropractic. It's a very, what they would call heart-centered profession, mm-hmm. right? And uh, there's a lot of other service providers out there that also come from like a a deep service desire and it's heart centered. And in fact, that's one of the reasons that we do what we do is because we, we know um, helping chiropractors for very long and helping other service providers that that's actually also their struggle. It's something that unifies them and connects them, but it's their struggle because they want to help and serve the people that they take care of so deeply that they would be willing to give it away. And that means that oftentimes on the other side of that, the business actually struggles because the business hand and the service heart or service hand, they don't necessarily connect in the way that we would like to have a successful flourishing business. It's sometimes a battle. Yeah. And I think that you guys talk about something when you reference your book that is incredibly powerful, that really hits home for me. And that's that nobody teaches you how to run a business while you're going through learning how to do your job and your profession. So whatever that service provider is that you're in, whatever field that is, if there was a business course in school, it wasn't actually a business course. It was more of, you know, a management course of people rather than an actual business course. And if anything, it was a course, like how could you possibly have built a a foundation for success with a course? And one of the things, I guess a term that a lot of, especially professionals don't like to embrace is the idea that it's a trade school. Mm -hmm. You're going to law school. Mm -hmm. It's a trade school, going to medical college, trade school, uh, chiropractic trade schools. Sometimes we say trade school, we think like, well, like plumbers, or, or, yeah. but, but it's a trade school. So their job, I, I happen to sit on the board of uh, the Sherman College of Chiropractic in Spartanburg. Um, and so, you know, sitting there and helping to guide the, the, the trajectory of an academic institution, you realize the job of the institution is to teach you to be really good at the trade. You're supposed, you know, we're supposed to graduate great chiropractors or great lawyers or great medical doctors, but not necessarily great uh, business people. But what's interesting is probably for, I mean, I would imagine in law school, just your garden variety lawyer, you dream of, you know, either owning or having your own firm or becoming a partner. Mm -hmm. Nobody's teaching you how to do that. They're teaching you how to be a great lawyer. That sort of becomes that missing piece. But it's not the fault. It's easy to blame the, the, the college. It's easy to blame the institution. It's not the institution's fault. But that's also why, like, you know, programming like this and books and all of the resources that are out there 
are extremely valuable. I think the thing is to create a consciousness amongst the students and amongst the providers that this is a key element that is missing in order to create the lifestyle that they deserve. It's a fine tuning yeah. a skill set and not cultivating a business mindset. And so that's what we help to do. And I'm you may you probably experience that as well. I don't every I don't, day. I was gonna say every yeah. day. <laughs> yeah, I mean there's there's so many things that because getting to a postgraduate service-based profession is such a journey for people and it's such mm -hmm. an investment and it in some ways you know i i did an interview with a pharmacist one day that said that she felt like pharmacy school trained the human out of her and mm -hmm. i could totally relate to that because mm -hmm. they're crash coursing you on how to pass the tests that you need to be able to pass to yep. get to where you can get the experience that you need to get to become the great service professional that you need to be to have the life you want. And then little do we know that that life that we're creating for ourselves isn't actually what we want because nobody's ever asked us to right. look at what it looks like to have that profession. I love what you guys stand for so much because of that, because I know what it feels like to love a profession and hate the life that that profession has created mm -hmm. so much. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that what you guys are doing is just so amazing in helping people overcome that. So I'm really interested to know because um, I feel like there is a moment and I'm, I want your guys' opinion on this. I feel like there's a moment in every service-based professional's life where they are willing to have this conversation. And, and that moment is small before that moment. You can't tell them any of this. They don't want to listen. They love their life. They love their job. You don't know what you're talking about. And after that moment, they're done. They don't want to listen to you. They're going to, you know, go live on a beach in Maui and figure out how they're going to, you know, survive with no money. Um, how do you capitalize on that moment in that small time frame? Or am I totally wrong in the fact that that moment exists? Well, I think that the moment exists. Mm -hmm. I do think that it, it, it presents itself in some cases multiple times. Um, because it just sort of depends on their trajectory. Money and success is an interesting drug. Um, so sometimes people can, um, you know, kind of have that moment, but then, you know, they get a big contract, land a big client, you know, their, their practice boosts, they have a big year. And then they're like, well, this isn't so bad. One of the things, though, too, I, I, I tell everybody is we have to be real careful. And I, I feel like this is kind of what you're saying, Amber, is that Oftentimes that we go out into our business, we end up just systematically building our own jail cell. Like mm -hmm. we are out there and we, we think that we're doing good, but we're just every day tying ourselves more and more to, you know, our business, our practice, our, what, what our clients, um, you know, all of a sudden you find out that, you know, you're on call 23 hours a day, people are calling you. And sure, the, the money is good, but now you're sacrificing your health, your relationships, but there's no way out because like you said, the alternative is move to Hawaii and you know just live have and live on a beach out of a box. Or I think. So, yeah. so that's where the frustration comes is because the very thing that most people love and are passionate about becomes the very thing that's holding them back from pursuing their dreams or their vision. Yeah. yeah, it's the golden handcuffs, you know, that's what we talk about. You've handcuffed yourself to, to the business. And I think there is that moment. And oftentimes what we do is we just shed light on the fact that the reason they're in that place is because they don't necessarily know the end game. Mm -hmm. Most service providers come out of school and like Sean said, they're building these walls and this essential jail cell and they don't know what they're building it for. They don't have an idea that they want to sell it or create a legacy or bring somebody else in. So they can't see the way out, right? They can't, they can't find the key. And sometimes it's just about, let us find the key. Let's figure out what the end game is. And once they can focus in on that, then that passion gets reignited because then they're taking the steps to eventually get there. Yeah, I think it's really cool because of the fact that I can see myself in everything that you guys are saying mm -hmm. in the different parts of the journey that I've been on. Um, and, and I can see it in others as well in the conversations that I have with people mainly in the legal field, because that's the circle I run in, where we talk about this idea of fulfillment and happiness and work-life balance. And those terms seem to be foreign in that profession and mm -hmm. in most service-based professions. 
And I'll never forget having a conversation with a really good mentor of mine. And he was talking about me making the shift to the coaching business. And, and I told him, I said, there's seems to be a couple different types of attorneys. There's the lifers that don't care that they're building this jail cell for themselves because this is all they've ever wanted. And then there's everybody else who at some point in time wake up and it's a different time for everybody and wonder what type of life they created for themselves and mm -hmm. how do they get out of it. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, I am jealous of those people. And I said, what people? He says, the people who love practicing law, I don't know what that feels like. Mm -hmm. And I said, you've been doing it for 30 years. How do you not know what that feels like? And he's like, I just, there's, there's no way out of it. Mm -hmm. And I thought, man, like what a depressing place to feel like you <laughs> yeah. have to be right. Or the, the conversation I'm sure you guys hear all the time of, well, I just have to stick with this for another 10 years and then I can retire. And then I'll let you guys help me figure out how I can have that life that I want to have. Right. Mm -hmm. So how do we start these conversations? How do we start to break down those walls that people have built and show them that there is a way to have the profession that you want to have, that you've chosen with the schooling that you have, and also the life that you want to have, that you get to decide what your practice looks like and your profession looks like. Well, I think that we just, you know, first of all, we have to have an admission that we don't know what we don't know. Um, my experience with lawyers that are pursuing an entrepreneurial life is that there's oftentimes a big um, self-confidence uh, issue that is it stems from the profession itself and not being a lawyer, but the structure, right? Mm -hmm. Because when you graduate, you don't go to, you know, right into being a partner. You have to start out somewhere. So you go and you take a job at a firm and it's a low level job. And what that means is that you get worked extremely hard and you attempt to prove yourself. And so right there, when I, when I said that, like prove me. So now we start this entire journey. I mean, think about it. If, you know, when we talk about the corporate world of practicing law, but even just the corporate world itself is a, is a, is a, is a futile journey of attempting to constantly prove yourself over and over and over. And if the plan does not progress or accelerate as you desire, which it never does, <laughs> that then causes you to have doubt. That begins to make you think that you might be less and you're watching other people. So now you have this comparison, comparison syndrome. syndrome. <laughs> and it, like it's, it's, all of this is inherent in the environment itself. And so I think that the first thing is to say, look, I'm a product of my environment mm -hmm. and I don't know what I don't know. But if I were to just step out of this and take a look around, yeah, maybe maybe these guys are right. Maybe I do because to look, very few lawyers are like, yeah, I have self-confidence issues is you know, usually no we don't say those about. words right you don't <laughs> say that but if you were to reflect and be honest about it you know that's how we can begin to break the shell because that's part of what keeps you stuck there mm -hmm. is because first of all you have to have the confidence to say i could do something else and i'm not saying do something else that's not law but i could mm -hmm. create a podcast i could become a coach i could become a consultant i could um start to market for other for, like, there's so many things that we could do i could advocate i could start a not not a not-for-profit there's so many things i could do but your environment constantly tells you that you could, you can't, like, that's not smart. You can't do it. How, like, and so I think that you have to take control of your own environment and begin to shape it internally. Affirmations, you know, positive thoughts, being around other people who are affirming to you, like, yeah, we can get out of this collaboration, relationship mm -hmm. building, all of the skills. I mean, and you're learning it as a lawyer, you're just learning it to try and get clients not really learning it to try and leverage yourself out wow. of a situation. Yeah. You guys are, you're totally speaking to my soul right now. I feel like you guys are my people. Um, and I love that this issue is identified because it's so needed, um, especially in the service based profession. And, you know, when I was studying for the bar, I, people would try to tell me, Hey, it's going to be okay. You're going to be fine. And I would get like, angry, right? You have no idea what this is like. You cannot possibly tell me that it's going to be fine because for 30% of the people who take this test, it's not fine, right? right. So you can't <laughs> tell me it's going to be fine. And I feel like on the other end of this, it's a similar thing, right? You, you have, in order to have these conversations with a service-based professional, you have to be able to identify, I truly know what you are feeling because I've been there. Right. Otherwise we tend to put those glasses on that say, yeah, you might have a point, but there's really no way that you could know because you've never been in my shoes. And so now you guys get to say, 
but wait, I have, mm -hmm. and here's how we can get out of it. And I think that puts you in a really cool position. Yeah. We, and I think that's what we, um, help people with the most because we've obviously gone through it ourselves is just shifting that perspective and that mindset. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that our mentors, Michael Port used to always say is all business problems are personal problems in disguise. And yes. I remember the first time I heard that line and I mean, I felt called out, right? Like all of a sudden yeah. you realize, man, isn't that the truth? You can reflect back on all the, ba the barriers and the limitations and the um, not reaching your goals and all the things that have happened in your life and realize it was either your relationship with others that was inhibiting you or your relationship with yourself. Yep. And it doesn't matter what it is. If it's, I can't see the way out. I don't, I'm going to be handcuffed to this business forever, just 10 more years. Or if it's not reaching a goal, oftentimes it really is just what's in between your ears and going on in your mind that are inhibiting you from doing that. And sometimes it just takes somebody else saying, I've seen it, I've lived it, and I've helped other people through it to begin to shift that mindset. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, you guys have the book, which we're going to talk about in just a minute. You have the Black Diamond Club where people can come in and learn from you. And you're doing the podcast. I've always wondered, you know, how, even though I might not have listened in law school, it would have been amazing to have these conversations in law school and have those seeds planted. How do we start to have conversations with service-based professionals that are at the beginning of their grad school education to tell them that, your career gets to look like whatever you want it to look like. And you don't have to put yourself in the box that society is going to create for you based upon the expectations of your profession. How do we start that conversation early? Well, I think you are starting it right mm -hmm. by committing to a podcast, um, you know, committing to getting this podcast out. I mean, we could target, you know, students at colleges, um, having more of these conversations, but look, like you said too, I think super important. Um, some people just aren't Ready, ready to hear exactly. that, right? So yeah. I think, you know, using something like the internet to mm -hmm. part content on so that people hopefully will find it at that right time. Or if they're not ready, maybe they'll at least remember I heard this discussion and they can go back and find you. Um, but I think that, you know, we need more people like you who have done it and who are speaking about it and sharing about it so that you know, we can sort of set a new standard for people. But at the same time, look, I respect, like you said, there's a portion of people who are like, that's what they want to do. Yeah. You know, we work with people that have said, I just want to, I just want to work for someone else and do what I do well and just get paid. And that's it. Right. And not have to worry right? about, anything, about anything. And we respect that too. But it's a shame when, when people have a gift inside of them that goes unrealized because they got put in a box. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, I 100% agree. Yeah. And it's interesting. We actually have, um, we started a, a, something called the club and it's for chiropractic colleges and it's a business club essentially where we teach them a lot of the basic business fundament fundamentals that we teach other service providers. And it's a little bit hard to get off the ground because if you think back to when you were a student and you were in law school, you had a, it's like a one track mind. You're just oh, thinking yes. about what do I have to learn to jump through the hoops to be able to pass the test. And it's the same in chiropractic. They have to take their national boards and that's all they're thinking of. What do I have to learn? Laws of perpetuity. What, laws of perpetuity. Yeah. <laughs> oh, don't say that word, man. I, I still, ha I have been out of law school for 13 years and I still have PTSD over the word perpetuity. <laughs> <laughs> Response to it. I love right? It. No, I definitely agree with you. Actually, um, I tell this story often that I remember having that conversation. I remember a whole like section of one of my classes about things you could do with your law degree besides practice law. And I thought they were out of their mind. Like, why would anybody spend all of this time going through law school and then passing the bar and doing all of the stuff they need to do if they didn't intend on being in a courtroom? That was like, ridiculous to me. And then I've been practicing for 10 years and all of a sudden I'm like, okay, how do I get out of this courtroom? Like, how do you keep the areas of the law that you love? Right. And then that, so I, I get it. I get it. So you have this book, which I love the title, none of your business. Um, that talks about all the things that we don't know about running a business and, and be putting that professional knowledge that we know into practice in business. How can people find that? What's the best place for them to be able to get in contact with you to discuss that? How can they reach out to you? 
Yeah, um, my email is Sean, S-H-A-W-N, at blackdiamondclub.com. That's my personal email. If anybody listening uh, shoots me an email and just says, I'd like to get a copy of the book, I'll be happy to send you a digital copy in reply. Um, or if you have questions or want to you know, further converse about any of these topics, super happy to assist anybody that reaches out. If you want a hard copy of the book that's available on Amazon, it's called None of Your Business. Our podcast is the exact same name as well. Um, but yeah, we try to be super accessible. We have a passion for helping service providers to find their gift and share that gift with the world. And one of the saddest things, the reason why we wrote the book is that most of the best service providers, I mean, you know, we've been talking a lot about lawyers, but the, the, the best lawyers in the world live in relative obscurity because they don't embrace the concepts of marketing, sales, entrepreneurship. They don't market themselves. We just get to see the lawyers that are on TV and then we automatically think that they're the best. Um, but that doesn't mean they're the best. They just have the best marketing skills. They are, they are using PR and they're, they're getting their name out there. It doesn't mean they're, they're technically the best. And so mm -hmm. imagine a world where all of the technically the best people were actually out there leveraging their business skills to promote themselves. Then the public would have an awareness that, oh my gosh, you mean there's lawyers that care and spend time mm -hmm. and win or whatever the thing is. Or doctors that, you know, listen to me and don't, aren't writing the prescription before I'm done with my sentence. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a lot of that. You know, there's musicians and hairdressers mm -hmm. and, I mean, everything that people just don't know about. So that's our passion, too. The other side of it is we want people to know about the best, but they won't know about you unless you embrace these concepts of, of entrepreneurship. Yes, it's so important. And especially in, a, you know, I love that you brought in, first of all, I love that you brought in the non postgraduate service based professionals, your musicians, your, you know, your coaches, your anybody that's providing a service, your hairstylist, real estate agents. I talk to people all the time about the power of communication in mm. those fields. How important would it be if the, the person that's trying to buy a house that you take to for their 97th house and they say to you, um, I don't like this one and I don't know why, but the next one you show me, I might be able to figure out what's wrong with it so we can find a house I like, right? How amazing would it be able to be to communicate with those people in a way that shortens your time span? Right. So I love that your book talks about business and communication and all of these things in all service-based professions. But then also there's this marketing aspect in highly regulated professions where we've kind of been taught to be afraid of marketing because mm -hmm. of the regulatory authorities that sit over us in that. Um, so I'm wondering how much of that is discussed in your book for the service-based professionals that are listening. Well, a lot of the things that we teach um, are, are not regulated, which is interesting because you know, in, in marketing anything, and especially in service though, right, we, we have to create relationships. You know, it's super cliche that people want to do business with people they like and trust. But there's ways that we can create likability and we can create trust without talking about the losing weight we or curing cancer or contract law. We could get together around anything that you like. Let's say that you like you know, you're really good at rolling sushi. And I didn't know that. And you're like, Sean, I'd like to teach you how to, you know, make sushi. And I'm like, oh my gosh, Amber, let's get together. Well, you could start hosting a group of people that just get together because you're really great at rolling sushi. You teach me, we eat it, we, we fellowship together. At some point, I am going to ask you, Amber, what do you do? And you're going to say, well, I'm a lawyer. And I'm going to say, oh my gosh, do you think you could help me with? And then yeah. there, there was no like advertising of promises of results. It was, we created a relationship first and in every great relationship, I'm going to want to get to know more about you. And part of that, I'm probably going to ask you, what do you do? And that's, that's your cue to go ahead and pitch me on your services and what you have to offer the world. And because I like you, I'm either going to use you right away, or maybe I'm like, well, I don't really need a lawyer right now, but at some point, when I do, of course, I'm calling you my friend, my trusted confidant, someone who's preeminent. And it was all over sushi. Yeah, I I love that difference between the relational side of running a business and the transactional side of running a business. And I feel like that gets lost so much, um, again, in the analytical minds that we create, which is how do I solve this problem? And it always seems like the shortest solution from point A to point B is marketing dollars and website and ads and all of this stuff. 
when it's the long-term game that matters and actually creates relational revolving business. Yeah. One of the biggest platforms that we teach about is you just creating community. And I think that one of the common denominators on with anybody across the planet is they do desire connection and they desire to be connected to people that think the same way they do and like the things that they like. And so that is what Sean is talking about is we teach people how to create community within their community. And by doing that, you become the most trusted advisor, the person that they look to for answers, the person that they want to go to when they're looking for that specific service that you provide. And on top of that, you know, then you're actually doing things, like you said, in a long-term way that reap long-term benefits. Marketing dollars only go so far and they reap short-term benefits. Relationships will stand the test of time. That's one way too. We look at the last couple of years, what's what happened. Community crisis proofs your business mm -hmm. because the relationships don't go away. The marketing does, right? It doesn't always work. And so that's, that's really been for, I think the people that we mentor and help. That's something that they've worked really hard on. Um, and it's benefited a lot of people and it feels really good, right? Yeah. <laughs> let, me, like, let me give you an actionable, um, actual tactic that you could utilize that fits this as an example. Um, when the pandemic began, mm -hmm. um, I mean, at the very beginning of it, we, we were super ahead of it with our clients because we just have some really good mentors and advisors that gave us really good information relative to what was happening. And so we told people um, in our groups that, look, this is real. This is going to be big. big. And it's going to affect a lot of people. Um, right away, we encouraged our, our um, members to start going out on Fridays. It didn't matter. Just once a week, they would go out on a Friday and all they would do is they would go to a local um, place of business and they would open up a $100 tab. They would just take $100 and they would say, and they would put it on Facebook. My name's Sean Dill. I'm here at Mary's Donuts. I'm just dropping off a $100 uh, tab. Feel free to come down here, get a donut, say, put it on Sean's tab. Look, if you need help, put it on my tab completely. If you can help, buy more. Buy more stuff. Let's support Mary's Donuts this week um, because it's all about giving back. The next week, I do it again. And then the next week, I do it again. We had no a client. No sale, no ads. Yeah, no sale. Yeah. I just kept Sorry. telling them. But look, how much business do you think they got? Because the yeah. whole community was like, look, it's Sean. He's saving all of our, our coffee shops and our sandwich shops and the smoothie. He's giving back. And so then people naturally want to do business with a benevolent person. We have clients that did that for have, have, are still doing it, that have done it for well over a year, $100 every week for over a year. But the um, ROI on that is immeasurable. I mean, the, the city council calls, the, the mayor calls, people engage them, say, we need your help over here. Have you thought about helping this business? Other people, people send, send money. And yeah, they say, put me in with you. The tabs really have grown. Neat. like. And it really, that's just community. And it has nothing to do with promoting your own services. It has to do with creating a bond with the people that eventually, because your service is so great, when they know what you do, of course, they're going to, going to want to engage you. There's so much about that that's powerful. I mean, how it, it's the macro version of paying for the coffee of the person behind you, right? right? Right. But doing it in a way that brings more business in instead mm -hmm. of just supporting somebody who's already at the business and, and being able to do that. You know, I think that what you just said is real. I'm processing it because it was so impactful. Um, we have these platforms, you know, as a podcast host, I have this platform, but anybody who's even not a podcast host has a platform in their social media posts. Mm -hmm. And we forget how powerful that can be for the things and people that we support. And I think that sometimes we fall into that societal shell of, oh, the whole world doesn't want to know what I'm up to. So we go and we we favorite or we visit our favorite place and we don't do a screenshot with a tag for them because nobody wants to know where I am, but the business wants people to know where you are. Right. And I think mm -hmm. we forget that. Yeah. You know, and the world is just a, a reflection of you. Um, and so if, if you don't, if you're like, well, I don't want to promote the small businesses or the businesses that I frequent, well, that's why nobody promotes yours. Yeah, you won't get promoted. Right? Like, you have yeah. to give before you can get, you have to, you have to initiate the behavior that you want to see reflected back on you. So whether that's, you know, giving a hundred dollars as a tab or helping somebody out or just promoting their business, oftentimes too, we get super selfish and we only want to promote our own business. 
promoting other people's business actually makes you look really good. And people are like, wow, why are you promoting all these other people's business? But that attracts people to yours. Um, and look, those other businesses, if they realize who you are and they're like, hey, Sean, you keep promoting my business, let me give you a shout out or let mm -hmm. me promote you mm -hmm. because they realize that you're being benevolent. Put Always put the give in front of the get. You know, whatever you want, reflect it out first and then watch how much of it you receive. It goes out into the world, it gets amplified, it comes back to you. Yeah. And I think it's really important to note that like, you really have to have that true intention too, because people can see through the intention. Yeah. So if you have that person that says, oh, I'm listening to Sean and Lacey right now. And they said that if I went out for the next 12 weeks and spent $1,200 in $100 every business, that eventually it would come back to me. So I'm going to do that. And I'm going to wait. Like that energy isn't the same right. as... Let me go support this business. And so I think you know, that you know what? intention they don't, is so important. I was going to say. They don't do it for 12 weeks. They, yeah. they, when you have the wrong intention, you give up way sooner because you're like, yeah. oh, I did it three times. I didn't get any any return and because you're, you're looking at it completely wrong. And I just got to say, too, the other thing is, is number one, you have to do it with no expectation of return. That's yeah. the most important. And then secondly, oftentimes the return doesn't come directly in the form of getting a new client. It doesn't come directly in the form of you exchanging additional money, right? Sometimes it comes in the form of an opportunity or a new friendship or a new relationship. And so I always encourage people to don't be looking for a specific thing because the universe is going to give you something in return, but it doesn't necessarily come directly from that. So that's important. It could well. come in more publicity. We've had clients that the local news reaches out and yep. says, hey, we've seen what you're doing. You and so do maybe they didn't get clients from that activity, but then they, a story ran on the news or in the newspaper and then they got clients. They could, you, you'd get a return, but it might not be the return that you intentionally mm -hmm. set out to get because that's, yeah. like, that's not the right way. You know, this is just an amazing example of exactly what you said earlier about some of the things that you're talking about and teaching are counterintuitive to what we would think in marketing and also not regulated because they're human behavior, not selling a product or service, which I think is really cool. So let's talk for just a second about the Black Diamond Club. What is it and who is it for? Black Diamond Club is essentially a group of like-minded service providers that are looking to grow their businesses and make a bigger impact. And they're people that are all the way from just starting their business and making their first dollar to people that are making their first million. And the great thing about the group is they are highly, highly supportive individuals. So we also believe that you can't give what you don't have. And that if you want to make an impact, the more that you have, the more that you can give. And so everybody in the group is supported. Um, we go in there and we teach about not only marketing strategies um, and sales strategies, but most importantly, mindset strategies. What does it take to have the mindset of an entrepreneur to be able to make that impact and live the life that you desire? And so it really is a great place. And we always say when you have a great community, the community becomes a community. So when you go into the Black Diamond Club, they are more than excited and willing to help you with any question that, they, that you have and share everything that they've had that has helped them be successful. So it's a fantastic group. I'm really excited to um, share your social links with people so that they can continue to learn with you. So the information for your book, the information for the Black Diamond Club and all of your social links will be in the show notes. But really quickly before we wrap up one more time, what's the best way for people to reach you? Yeah, shoot me an email, Sean at BlackDiamondClub.com. Just reach out directly. You know, what's funny is like, so many times, um, you know, you see opportunity right in front of you and then you're like, oh, I'll write later or whatever. Like, mm -hmm. no, just shoot us an email. It's actually my email. I don't have an assistant that curates them. I'll answer you back. Um, we'll get you any resources that you need, point you in the right direction, um, help you in any way that we possibly can. I love it. I love it. All right. So let's switch just a little bit to the success element of this podcast. I ask every single one of my guests the same question. And I'm really excited to hear your guys' answer as fellow professional service providers that have made that shift for yourself. What does success mean to you? How do you define it for yourself um, within your life? I'm going to give you an opportunity to think about it. For me, um, I get I get that question. You know, hopefully everybody has gotten that question or at least has pondered it. Um, First of all, the very 
stereotypical answer that I get from clients is um, they tell me I, I want freedom. And especially in the context of everything yeah. that we've been talking freedom. about, I want freedom. I want to be able to do what I want when I want. That is like the very stereotypical answer. Um, I tell those clients that's not actually, I don't think what you are pursuing. What for me, success is defined by one word and that's options. Um, if you are successful, you have options and you can fly private or you can fly commercial, but you have the option. You could work from home or you could go into your brick and mortar, but you have the option. And what that does is it allows you to create a life by design mm -hmm. because, you know, and, and look like freedom, like if I got freedom, then that kind of implies that I would like leave it. Like I would like, but I, I'm not, I'm not trying to, the beach. Yeah, I'm not trying to <laughs> run away. <laughs> like, and I love that to bring it back full circle in what you were talking yeah. about. I don't have to cut my ties or my identity with being mm -hmm. a chiropractor or a lawyer or a medical doctor, but I have the option. I have the option to practice. I have the option to consult. I have the, I still have a license. I could, I have the option. That's when I've reached success because I am no longer in a cage. I'm no longer in a jail cell. When you're in a jail cell, you don't have options. You must get to work by the time the first client's there. You must stay until they leave. You right? You have all of these things that are bleeding your options. So for me, one word, options. <laughs> and obviously, he's my husband, so we've talked about this a lot. Options is a great answer. <laughs> but for the sake of not repeating it, I would say to add on to that, um, I would call it validation. And what I mean by that is validation from the clients that we help and the, and the people that we serve, that their lives are changed and impacted by the things that we teach. And um, I mean, our desire is to make an impact and to have our ability um, to make change be far reaching, farther than being able to just take care of patients within the brick and mortar walls of a chiropractic office. We always wanted that to be able to ripple out. And we knew by getting out of the office, we could make a greater impact. So validation from clients saying, here's how my life has changed since working with you. Here's what I've been able to do. Here's the freedom and the options that I've been able to have. Here's what's happening with my children. When I get that validation back from them, I know that I'm on the right path and that I'm achieving the success here that I would desire. Those answers are, are so amazing. And I think that, you know, as somebody who is on the journey that you guys are really helping people go through, what you are doing is truly changing the world. Like the more that people are happy with who they are and what they're creating and the more that that energetic vibration raises for them to be fulfilled in the life that they're creating for themselves, like the better the world is as a whole. And I know that you guys know the power of what you're doing, but from somebody who just met you, who is so familiar with the pain points that you guys talk to, like you are truly changing the world. Well, thank, thank you. you. Um, with that being said, I'd love to wrap up with a quick um, random round before we end the call. Are you cool with that? You got it. Let's do All it. All right. If you guys could do any profession other than what you are doing now, what do you think would be fun to try? <laughs> well, it's, I don't know what she's going to say. What am I going to say? <laughs> You're going to say lawyer. I know. I'm gonna, <laughs> don't do lawyer. it. Run. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. Let's bring it full circle. But I was actually going to, to go to school to be a lawyer. And um, I was working in chiropractic offices. And one day the chiropractor said to me, what are you doing? You need to be a chiropractor. This is this is like your journey. And, I, you know, here I am. And so if he hadn't said that, I may not be here today, but I was going to be a lawyer. I, I like to try it. to be a hedge fund operator. <laughs> Um, yeah, the, neither of those carry the um, heart-centered, holistic yeah. approach that you have created now. So, um, yeah, we'll move on from that. Now, um, <laughs> if you guys could time travel, where would you go and why? Oh, gosh, that's a good one. Where would you go? Um, I'd go to, uh, this is not, not going to be interesting to anybody. I would go back to 1895. Uh, that was a year that chiropractic First was chiropractic founded investment. and it would be cool to be there and, and watch like kind of what people are, what the thought process was um, of the founders as they developed this like kooky thing in the beginning or like you know, cracking people's backs. <laughs> How did we get from that to where we are now? It'd be cool to watch. 
how close were they to being burned at a stake when right. they were like telling people that this could change their entire life? Yeah. Yeah. yeah that, that would actually be interesting to me. Um, Lacey, what, where would you go and why? I would actually time travel back about um, 13 years ago, a couple years before my dad passed away so I could spend more time with him. Oh my gosh. Every time I get that answer, I get chills. Um, my dad passed away when I was 18. Yeah. And um, somebody told me once when I asked that question, I wish I could go back and hear all the things my dad said when I wasn't listening. Ooh. And I thought, oh, yeah, that hits me in the soul. So I get I get that yep. for sure. Yeah. Other than your amazing book, None of Your Business, what is a book that you would recommend to new business owners or entrepreneurs or those professionals that are, are starting to look into getting out of that space or rounding their life out? I'm going to go way off the map of a book that I've never heard people recommend, but I think is amazing. It's called Pendulum by Roy Williams. Um, we're living in a time where um, you know we're at coming up to the peak of what is known as a we society. Um, this is repeated historically in 40 year runs. I mean, it can be tracked almost back to the beginning of time. Um, and the knowledge of where we are societal wise um, can really shape the way that we market, sell, communicate. Um, because we need to understand the group mindset. So pendulum. I love it. Lacey? For me, a book that changed my life. I always struggled um, with an abundance mindset when it came to money. And I know a lot of brand new entrepreneurs, people coming out of school, this is definitely a struggle. Um, so The Little Money Bible by Stuart Wilde, one of the Ooh. best books on the planet. Um, it, if you struggle with abundance and thinking about money in that way, the book is going to rub you the wrong way. That's the point. <laughs> so read it yes. again. So it changed my life on how I think about money. I'm excited to check that out. I actually have had somebody recommend Pendulum one time before, Ooh, um, oh, once man. in like 250 episodes. So not <laughs> okay. many, um, but I'm really excited to check both of those out. And the last question, because I am a music nerd, what's your pump up song? What is that thing that you put on when you just have to have a good day? I have like 9 million. I'm going to go, know. I'm going to go with Renegade um, because that's the song. I'm a big Steelers fan. Okay. Um, and I would I'll love to be you. at the stadium when they when they drop Renegade. That would be super cool. But I mean, so many. I love music too. Yeah, that's this awesome. Is, my is super random. It's November Rain. I don't know if anybody <laughs> knows November what? Rain. It's not even like a pump up song. Pump no, up song. I, that's one of the songs that I sing at the top of my lungs, and it lasts. Yes. The long version is super long, so you can just sing it. I've I've loved that song since the day. Yeah. <laughs> so no judgment there. Um, no, that's, that's amazing. Um, so I have a parent on this podcast. Okay. <laughs> right. No. So I never tell people this until after they answer this question, but I'm happy to share it with you now that you've answered. Um, I actually have a playlist of everybody's answers that is like my motivational playlist that goes from like church music to hardcore rap and everything in between. And so it. your songs will both be going in and November rain is not there yet. So, and it will take up the most space. It's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, Sean and Lacey, you guys are amazing. You guys are doing something fantastic in a space that needs it. Um, I love your energy. I love what you stand for. And I really appreciate you taking some time to spend with me in the audience today. Thank you, Amber. It was fantastic. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the More Than Corporate Podcast. If anything that was said during this episode resonated with you or provided value in any way, it would mean the world to me if you would head over to iTunes and leave a rating and review for the More Than Corporate Podcast. Thank you so much for taking the time to do that. I'm really looking forward to connecting with you. If you'd also like to connect, I've created a Facebook group that is full of amazing people who also make it their mission to live their best life every single day. If that's that sounds like something that you're interested in. The name of that Facebook group is Success Center. Head over there, request to join, and I look forward to connecting with you soon.